unless you can actually be really authentic with what you deliver. And for me, that's the worst advice ever. You know, I mean, go and find someone that's really successful and just copy them. But I mean, if that's not you and you don't have the same sort of personality, you're going to look like a fool. I don't want to be a product of my environment. I want my environment to be a product of me. Prestige Living Podcast. So with that, who do you want to be? It's glorious. <laughs> your hair looks great, Aaron. Thanks, <laughs> Hello, welcome to Prestige Living. I'm your host, Jay O'Brien, here with your co-hosts, Jordan Wilson and Kane German. Good morning. Today, our guest is a self-made individual who I originally came into contact with exactly a year ago, actually. Um, he started his real estate career at 22 years old, earning a million dollars his first year in the business in uh, GCI. Then the following year, bought the company he worked for. Since then, he's pioneered some of the best sales practices and until very recently was the CEO for Harcourts International. Now he's focusing his time and attention on his newly founded company, ALMH Consulting, where he's coaching and sharing his skills with the rest of the world. Without further ado, I give you Aaron Hodson. Aaron, welcome to the show. Wow. Hey. Well, so, hey. Hey. so originally, where are you from? Originally, I was born and bred in New Zealand. Uh, I left there when I was uh, probably just before my 20th birthday and moved to Australia. So, yeah, born and bred in New Zealand, but um, you haven't lived there for 20 plus years. So, Did the real estate start in New Zealand or Australia? In Australia, no, it didn't start in New Zealand. I, uh, you know, I think growing up as a kid in New Zealand, you've got to travel to sort of you know, spread your entrepreneurial legs, so to speak, and that's where I ended up going, and Australia was the first destination, and I was there for, probably for the best part of 10 years. So why real estate? What got you into real estate? <laughs> well, I'll give you the honest truth about why I got into real estate. When I was growing up as a kid, my best friend's mum was the number one selling real estate agent in New Zealand, and she used to drive around in really nice cars and drink coffee all day. And I thought to myself, well, whatever she does for a job, that's what I want to do, because it seemed like it was a pretty cool thing to do. <laughs> so I'm not going to tell you that I always had a love for real estate or anything like that. I mean, hey, I, you know, my love is working with people and then you know, sort of growing up and sort of being... You know, seeing what she was doing every day, it seemed like a pretty cool job to do. And, you know, she still is very, very successful over there. But that was probably my first inspiration. And then, you know, when I was living in Australia, I bought a rental property, you know, um, an investment. And that sort of going through the process sort of encouraged me to go down that line. And, yeah, and I just got up one morning, decided, hey, career change. And here we go. What did so you do before that? What you well, do? Before that, actually, like, this is, every, when, you know, when you go to a party and people say, what do you do for a job? And then everybody hates saying they're a realtor because everybody wants to know what the house is worth. Well, lucky for me, I used to always tell people I was a welder because that's what I did. I was, you know, I used to be a, a certified welder for Caterpillar and I used to work in the mines, you know, fixing and assembling brand new mining machinery for Caterpillar. So that was, you know, the reason I went to Australia. Um, you know, I was making a lot of money doing that and I set myself a goal to do it for three years and earn a lot of money and then, you know, go into something different and real estate was the choice from there. So... So now when I go to a party and people ask what I do, I tell them I'm a welder. It ends conversations very quickly because nobody <laughs> wants to know what a welder does for a job. <laughs> oh, wow, well, that sounds exciting. Yeah, that's it. Most people go, what is that? So, yeah, and I mean, that was, you know, that was what my, my trade, my, um, you know, what I was doing as a kid when I was going doing my apprenticeships and so forth. But, uh, you know, I always had a, a desire to work with people and do something a bit bigger out there. And, you know, when I was growing up as a kid, that was what, you know, the great opportunity was to make a lot of money. So you could get out into the, you know, the outback of Australia and work in the mines and, and a lot of money. And, you know, some made great success stories out of it. And most people just went broke and got stuck in that framework because, you know, you get, lived that lifestyle. Aaron, when you made the switch from welding to real estate, how old were you? 22. So did you get any pushback or any resistance from, like, your support system? Like, you're going from a stable... <laughs> job where you're making good money and then all of a sudden you're going to like i'm assuming it works the same way is is a commission only yep. you know not not secure paycheck did you how was the um feedback when you made that choice i didn't hear any to be honest with you i'm, I'm, a, I'm a little bit of a um you know if i see something i want something i tend to go for it and i you know as you were saying that i was sort of thinking did my wife at the time have any issues with it i actually don't remember her saying anything to be honest with you maybe she did i just didn't hear it but <laughs> you know, hey one of the one of the big challenges i suppose you can that talk? I, yeah. <laughs> I didn't actually realize i was married but <laughs> i think for me one of the things that i learned when i got into real estate is i actually never changed my uh, perception of money you know i've never been that person that's been driven by the big paycheck i've always believed that if i got into something that i really loved doing that the income would come so i do remember though that first two or three months in real estate was very very tough financially because I was spending, you know, a hundred times quicker than what I was making, and we all know when you go from sure. a, 
big paying salary job to a uh, commission only job, things dry up pretty quickly. So that just motivated me to do it quicker. So what did you do the first two, three months? Hey, I just went out and met people. You know, I, 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 you know, with the coaching business that I do now, I get a lot of people saying, well, I don't know anybody. I, you know, I've, you know, I haven't grown up here, so what do I know? I mean, I was from a whole different country and bought a house, and so I basically you know, picked up and moved 7,000 miles. So my number one goal was just to meet people, you know, just to get out and introduce myself to people and you know, make some friends and, and, and let people know what I did for a job. So and that's all I did for the first two months was just I just wanted to build a database of people that knew me as quick as I possibly could. And... What was the average sales price at that time when you were 22 in the area that you were selling in? I, I, I actually remember in my first year, I broke the sales record for the area that I was working in, and, and it was $267,000. And I, was, I thought I was an absolute <coughs> rock star when that happened. I mean, now you look at it, and it's quite ridiculous. But my average sale price was you know, around the 300 mark. So that's and, kind of my point is that that's very low, and you grossed a million dollars your first year, right? Yep. yep. So that's a ton of units. Yep. And how do you have that sort of volume straight out of the gate in your first year? Hard work. You know, I mean, I, I never focused on the on the volume. I mean, I was lucky that the office that I worked in had a whole lot of young, motivated people in it. And, you know, if I could ever look back on my career, you know, it's what you were saying, Jordan, did I get any pushback? But one of the biggest success stories I had in my career is nobody in my office said that I was ridiculous trying to think about doing the things that I was doing. You know, I've always been one of those people that's always wanted to be the best at what I was doing and we had a couple of real superstars in the office and my goal was just to be better than them and I wasn't worried about the, <clears throat> excuse me wasn't worried about the numbers um, as in dollar wise I was just I just needed to do 10 15 transactions a month and that's all I was set out to do you know I had a couple of higher sale prices in there and you know the way that I worked my business I wasn't solely focused on one area I had a relationship base in a certain area and that sort of spread my business you know quite a long way and I'm pretty persistent so yeah so after that first year what happened but it sort of took off I you know, started to learn a lot more about my business and you know I must admit my first year there was you know there was a lot of things to it as well like I'm not going to sit there and say I made a million dollars in the toughest market in the world it was a pretty good market you know our average time on market was three days Jeez. yeah you know, so it was flying so you know, there's a big portion of that 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 actually helped me do the things that I need to do but the second year wasn't so good <clears throat> you know we had a, a really big crash in the market you know, where I was selling real estate, it's a real uh, resources-driven economy. So, you know, the resource price changes and so does the house price. So, you know, I had to really restructure my business to keep, you know, that, that, that level going. And, you know, I was just lucky that my number one skill is dealing with people. And if I could keep people connected to me, my business is always going to be fine. And what were some of those things that you did, the unique sales tactics, like the open houses, for example, yep. on the weekends? I used to call my open house days game day because for me, you know, most people go and open a house with the view they want to try and sell it. You know, whenever I opened a home, it was the view of just going to list some more homes and meet more people. So my, my assistant and I used to call open home day game day. And on a Saturday and Sunday, we would actually open 30 houses. So we'd do 15 on a Saturday and 15 on a Sunday, and we would do them for 20 minutes. And it was only so that we could get as many people as we possibly could into the home and actually show them what we could actually do. So it was, you know, it's like a job interview. So my, one of my biggest success stories was actually doing that many opens because by the fourth, fifth, sixth open house, you'd meet everybody a couple of times. So the relationship process was so much further ahead than what anybody else was getting. So I think I think a little bit different to most. I'm not there to do the sale. I'm always looking for what my next opportunity is. I mean, you know, the sale will happen despite what we do, but the relationship is something you've really got to work on. So everything I was doing with my opens was how do I build more relationships with more people that are going to give me more opportunities. So you'd leverage the open house, get more listings. What, uh, what other things would you do to get listings? Hey, I have a, a program that I run called the, My Raving Fans, which is a total new look. I mean, the Raving Fans term has been around for years, but just the way that I actually handle it. You know, for me, I sat there and I thought, well, if I have 50 full-time prospectors out there looking for business for me, then my business is going to go through the roof. So I focus solely on building relationships with people that would always uh, be a raving fan to what I did for a job. So if they ever heard of anybody thinking of selling real estate, I had full-time prospectors out there doing it for me. And relationships do that. You, know, you look at some of the most successful salespeople in the world, it's their connections that make them successful. It's not always their sales skills. You know, I might not have been the best salesperson in the world. I got pretty good at it after a while. But even if you're not the best salesperson, if you can build a real core network of people that respect you and trust you and like you for what you actually do, your business will always go through the roof. Biggest challenge for most is they can't maintain it. So prior to all this real estate stuff, you were boxing, right? I was. That was my. I went to. I went to boarding school on a boxing scholarship. Yes. And then, and Whoa. you were cooking too. 
I've always had a love for cooking. Yeah, I don't know actually where I got it from, and I hope my mum never hears this because there's not a single person in my family that can cook. My mum <laughs> would have to be one of the worst cooks in the world. So I don't so, know where I got it from. <laughs> so let's talk about the boxing a little bit. Yeah. How, how'd that start? And what did well, you would, do with that? Boxing was was not. I won't say it was a love that I had. I mean, I was growing up in New Zealand. Every little kid wants to be a, a superstar rugby player. You know, rugby's our national sport. I was a very good rugby player when I was growing up, but uh, unfortunately for me, at about the age of thirteen or fourteen, I stopped growing. You know, so everybody else kept going, and <laughs> so, you know, I was a big kid at twelve, but wasn't so big at fourteen. And then, you know, I wanted to be a rugby player, and I wanted to go to a, a school called St Stephen's on a on a rugby scholarship. Couldn't get it. You know, I was good enough, but just wasn't big enough. Um, I was, you know, I used to do a lot of boxing for training for rugby, and you know, got pretty good at that. So I got a scholarship to go to St Stephen's on a on a boxing scholarship. Um, <coughs> and my plan was, this will work great. I'll go to the school, I'll play rugby, and I'll see how good I am, and I'll end up playing rugby, and I won't have to worry about the boxing. But <laughs> that never happened. So, and because I was, you know, still playing a lot of rugby when I was there, I was training with a lot of guys that were bigger and heavier than me with my boxing. So, you know, I was lucky enough to win a couple of national titles and so forth because I was always sparring and training with guys that were fifty or sixty pounds heavier than me so it was kind of like a, a, a side effect from what what happened so so you're just a badass all around no i'm, I'm a lover not a fighter but <laughs> no, yeah, you say that now. Yeah. so I mean, what, the, what, do you, what do you guys feed them that they get so big these rugby players they're monstrous no, man they're, no idea i mean i thought i was going to be that big at you know 13 or 14 i was the big kid and then i you know you go away for christmas break and you come back the following year and everybody's a foot taller than you and you think what the hell's going on so <laughs> But yeah, hey, that's 20 odd years ago, and I mean, I, I never live off the fact that I was, you know, quite good at sports. For me, it was just a, an avenue to get somewhere else. I'd never had any visions of being a professional sportsman or anything like that. It was, I, mean, I must admit, I learned some of my best business and, and relationship building techniques from from the sports that I that I chose to do. You know, from boxing and the self discipline of what it takes you to get up every day and do it, because nobody wants to get up and get belted every day. And you've just got to learn to do things better, and that's what I learned from. From you know, going through those things with boxing, I had a great coach. You know, so that was a really good foundation for my business career. Yeah. So you just mentioned coach. What did you have any like mentors for real estate, or you just went in there, guns blazing? And- no. I mean, it's interesting. I mean, I've got a very different philosophy in the way that I do my coaching and, and training. And I mean, I've, the, I think that frustrates me a lot is we get a lot of people that get into real estate and they go and try and model themselves off somebody else. And you know, these coaches that are in the industry right now, and I don't want this to be controversial, but there's a lot of majority of the coaches out there have just never done it. And there's very few successful coaches that have actually been in real estate and had a real phenomenal amount of sales. You know, there's a lot of people that struggle with real estate, so let's go and be a coach. And I think that's one of the struggles. I've had a lot of people that I've admired that have done some great things. And I think for me, I've taken a little bit from everybody and put it in <coughs> and, and you know, made it my own. Because real estate, we've got one asset, and that's ourselves, our attitude, our personality. And you've got to make it the best it can be. So. Yeah, I've got a few friends and family members that are in real estate, and every time I bring up like some of your ideas and your your techniques and strategies and stuff like that, I get the same look, like, oh, like the, like the light bulb goes off, like, oh wow, that's really interesting. Yeah. Just like from the attitude of the open houses to mm-hmm. doing to doing the um, the yeah. ten ten twenty door knocking yeah. after the open house yeah. and, and stuff like that. Just a lot of. Yeah. Kind of, uh, you know, you shake shake out the old. Yeah. It's interesting train of though. Thought. When you look at anything that's successful in business, though, it's not about the actual activity. It's what the what the roll on effect is. You know, people want to deal with people they like. And I mean, one of the things I learned very early in my career, the better relationship I had with people, they actually forgive the things I didn't do very well. And I was always great at eliminating possibilities that could, you know, opportunities that could hurt my business. So by being too much of a salesperson, by being too aggressive, they look for things to go wrong. And I mean, if somebody really likes you, they'll forget the little things and they'll. Right. Work with you and you know it's all about how do you build the best situation or opportunity you possibly can i mean i get that a lot people the light bulb goes off but still most people don't go out and do it because it just seems too easy but i used to do it every single day i never you know people used to always say to me how many hours did you work to do those sort of transactions it wasn't a lot i was just very good at the things that i did very well and i stayed away from the things that i didn't do very well so just <clears throat> efficacy over efficiency yeah just make sure that whatever you're doing in your business you're doing something that's actually improving your business or making you some money is a lot of people get buried just doing stuff, doing things every day that makes them feel like they're contributing to the growth of their business, and the majority of it's not. The majority of it's just things to fill the day and so we feel good about ourselves. Yeah. Mm. 
So how long were you in Australia? Because after that, you moved around quite a bit, right? Yes. I, uh, when I got into real estate, and I didn't buy it the second year. I bought it the third year. I, I had, a, had a couple of years of that, and I got a, made an offer to, you know, to buy out the business. And so I thought this would be great, and I bought the business, paid a great price for it, and then realized that I was 70% of the turnover and just mm. paid a fortune for myself, which was, you know, <laughs> that was a wake-up call in business. But, hey, it was also an opportunity because I bought a, you know, a relatively successful office. Um, when I first bought it, I didn't take over the full leadership. I was just, you know, just one of the major shareholders. Um, I kept selling for another year or so, and then I got up one day and decided that I, you know, if, if I want to do this thing right, I'm going to take this office and make it the best I can. And you know, I went from being the number one salesperson in the country on a Friday to the Monday never selling another house. You know, I decided that I was going to stop selling and run and grow the business. Um, so I, I, I opened another three or four offices. We went from doing about three to four million GCI to nearly thirty million GCI in <coughs> two years. Wow. And it was just, I did the same thing I did with my sales career with what I did with growing a business. You know, I treated every agent as if they were raving fans and top clients. And I just kept growing that, that base. And uh, then I basically, I, put, I sold that. Uh, I got up one, there's a, a long story, but the reason why I sold it, I just went to a board meeting one day and, you know, I had a lot of um, investors in the business and they would just go straight to the back page and see how big their dividend check was. And, you know, they were just sitting <laughs> back and enjoying the ride. And I just, got, I just got up one day and said, that's just not what I want to do. I wanted to grow the business. And um, so I decided to sell it. Um, you know, I felt like I'd done what I needed to do personally. Um, I had an offer to uh, take the Harcourts brand international. So, you know, to go do a bit of international travel and launch the brand. Um, so I sold the business and took on that international role. So I went from there to China, uh, launched the business in China, and then I went to South Africa, to Indonesia, I went and spent quite a bit of time in India, then back Jesus to China Christ. and came to the US and thought, that's it, I'm going to lose my passport and I'm staying here. I love the weather. It was you know, one of the few places I've actually felt settled. So I had a bit of a whirlwind 10 years doing that. But you know, it's a lesson in business that you can't learn at any school or any, anything like that, you know, understanding people. Uh, no matter what the nationality, no matter what the language, no matter what the culture is the biggest fundamental thing you can ever learn to be successful in any business. And I think you know, me having to travel to some of these countries where you know, what you perceive to be on the outside isn't always the way it is, it makes you think really hard and learn some things that you'd never learn in the everyday world, so to speak. Mm. Yeah, that's crazy because in the grand scheme of things, like it's only been 20 years, you know, 22 years old and you're now 42. And that's not that much time, you know, to, to have so much under your belt and so much experience on the forefront of it all, doing the sales and then also the management and, and kind of going through all that cyclically and living in all these different regions. And now, um, as of recently, no longer CEO of Harcourts, correct? Yes. And now you're doing your coaching. Yes. So you want to talk a little bit about that? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But I've got a question I'd like to ask you, though. What were you doing 20 years ago today, Jay? 20 years ago today... I was in school. No, I was in Big Bear with my family and how, celebrating how old Christmas, you, and I was nine years old. Yeah, so 20 years is a lifetime. I mean, I think one of the things that people, you know, I quite often think that, though, you know, 20 years, that doesn't seem like a long time, but you can build a career and a fortune in 12 months. And I think most people, you know, I've made a lot of mistakes. I've done some things that haven't worked, but I've got up got up and you know made some changes and some directions to go a different different way but 20 years is a lifetime you know, i mean you sit where you are now and imagine where you'll be in 20 years your life will be different everything yeah. you do will be different and i think we can't get buried down in a time frame it's it's an activities based thing that we do you know if you want to make yourself or something of yourself it can happen very quickly but you've got to get out there and do it so hey, and the reason i went down the coaching path i've done it for you know over a decade with with people that i've met through my travels and uh, business ventures that i've been in and you know, I had a career goal when I first came to the U.S. of what I was going to do with Harcourts with the growth. And I set myself a very definitive plan that when I got up to a certain level with a number of people, number of offices, <laughs> that I would, you know, I'd have to sit down and make a decision whether that's what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. Um, you know, my passion is actually helping people achieve the success that I've, you know, been able, fortunate enough to achieve. And, you know, that I just got up one day and decided that was, today was the day I'm doing it. Um, and you know, launched the coaching business. Why well, I shouldn't say launch it? It was, it's been going for a long time, but it just made it my number one focus. That's right. Okay. Well, I'm going to go back to the real estate thing. When you decided on Friday, you were like top salesman Monday. Yep. You're so just going to do the coaching and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. How? How and why? I mean, never mind about the why, but mm -hmm. how? How did that 
feel because I, I feel like you're the kind of person who wants to have everything in control and then to lose all that control to kind of just like coach these other people and like now it's not in your hands directly how did mm-hmm. that feel it was the most horrific two days of my life <laughs> it was, it was, <laughs> just two days bro oh it was it was, it was it was one of the toughest things I've ever been through because you go through this uh, this emotional roller coaster of like, do I let it go? And you, you asked me about resistance. That's probably one of the biggest times in my life where I've had a lot of resistance from people. You know, people saying you're mad. Why are you doing it? And but I think I could see something that was going to hold me back achieving the things that I wanted to do. And I just didn't want to have the office. I, you know, I was still a young guy. I was. 29 nearly 30 and I thought I I don't want to be that guy that sits in the office and just runs the real estate office there was bigger and better things for me to do Um, and I could also see I was making a lot of money for a lot of other people that weren't contributing the same thing and I wanted to grow more offices and do some things that these people probably wouldn't have been supportive of which could have ended up damaging relationships so I thought if there's ever a time to get out of something you do it when it's at its peak you know if you want to get top dollar for something when you sell it and that's why I made the decision to do it because I was going to get more money for that business then than I ever was going to be um, the market was flying, so there wasn't a lot of resistance to doing it, but it was not the easiest decision I've ever made in my life. It was tough. I mean, I, had a, I don't think I slept for 48 hours, and mm-hmm. I went backwards and forwards 100 times on whether it was the right thing for me to do. Um, so it wasn't just I went home on Friday and had a beer and thought, great, can't wait till Monday. It was just, yeah, you go through that emotional turmoil of, is this the right thing to do? And then how do you measure the success after that if it's not no longer in your control it's not your numbers anymore like how do you measure i feel like that would be a long tail to kind of hey, if you keep doing what you're doing i mean for me i you know selling real estate was like a sport it was it was fun so you know i enjoyed doing it but it wasn't you know lucky for me i'm not driven by the money if i think if i was driven by money i would keep selling real estate and you know it was fun but for me i had another career goal i, I like being known as the top agent i wanted to be known as the guy that built the best real estate company so for me it was just another career goal just another mental opportunity. Got it. So, so sorry, when I was just talking to you before, <laughs> I was actually talking about the emotion of selling the business. It wasn't going from the agent to the to the to the owner. Um, <clears throat> yeah, when I made that decision to do it, that was actually quite an easy decision because I, I sort of was over it. I'd kind of I was over the selling the houses. It had lost its sort of charm, the charm of doing it. And for me, I wanted a new challenge, which was to take other brand new agents or other people and actually give them a really great career and just teach them the things that I did. I mean, I've always been you know, somebody that's like to help people. So the teaching aspect of it was a real, was a driving force for me. Got it. Yeah. So what's going on now in the coaching world? Mate, it's, 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 it's really, really great. I mean, there's a lot of things going out there in the market. And, and I think the, for me, the coaching world's quite broken. There's a lot of things out there at the moment, which is just a whole lot of people replicating real lowball scripts and dialogues and just trying to get people to get some sort of business. And I think the, the change that needs to happen in the coaching world is some real authentic, you know, teach people how to, you know, to be the best they can be at what they know how to do, not give them something that everybody else is just out there replicating. Um, so for me, there's a big hole in it, and there's some great stuff out there in the coaching world, but there's a real, what's becoming really apparent is there's a real gap opening up between the really, really good and the average. And the average people are sticking with the low ball stuff because it's, it's a comfort zone, and the ones that want to get out of that comfort zone and really test themselves and, and, and try and push themselves to do some things that are a bit different have the opportunity to earn more money in this industry than they've ever had before because our competition is getting weaker. Um, and there is a real big door opening out for people that really want to take their business to the next level if they want to step outside the comfort zone and do something a bit different. And funny enough, the stuff that's a bit different is the easy stuff in the world to do. So for 2016, what are the plans around the consulting company? Hey, grow it! I've got a I've got a couple of exciting things happening this year. I've got a, a full online program coming out uh, early in the first quarter. I've got a, a, a book being released um, first quarter of well of 2016. A book's called Who Has Your Title. Um, which is you know, just funny enough it's based on the, the boxing mentality but it's just you know, showing people how they can actually come out and own what is themselves um, you know, teaching people not to just go out and replicate what everybody else is doing you know, that to be successful you've got to be the best you you can be so it's, um, you know, it's been a long process building that um, yeah, a lot more coaching. The online stuff's really good. Um, I've got some huge clients, um, you know, sort of international businesses that I'm doing a lot of leadership coaching with at the moment, which is really cool. So uh, managing, you know, merging of a couple of big leadership teams. Um, but yeah, just you know, breaking some holes and, and putting some new stuff <laughs> out there, and just maintaining real selectiveness about the people that I actually take on. You know, I'm not going to be one of these body shops that's just going to have you know, multitude of agents. If people want to commit to it, there's a there's a commitment from both sides. 
You know, you said something about replicating other people. I saw something online. Somebody who I don't take very seriously posted, um, like, you need to find someone who's successful and do exactly what they do. Yeah. And then that reminds me of something you said maybe a few weeks ago where it was like, you're only going to be the second best version of that person. Well, it's, like, it's not the second best. You're going to be a very second rate version yeah, of that second person. Yeah, second rate. I mean, hey, the... the Anything in, in life is successful. I mean, everybody's met people that are, you know, they might not be the smartest or the most intelligent, but, you know, people really like him, and there's a real element of success that comes with that. And, I mean, I could give you the best scripts and dialogues in the world, and you can go out and replicate them, and, and you'll only ever do what you can do. And, you know, besides the fact you don't have the cool accent, you're not going to do a very good job of it. So, <laughs> yeah, you know, trans- can we get a translator here? <laughs> yeah, that's a, unless you can actually be really authentic with what you deliver. And for me, that's the worst advice ever. You know, go and find someone that's really successful and just copy them. But, I mean, if that's not you and you don't have the same sort of personality, you're going to look like a fool. I feel like maybe not not exactly copy them, but follow their habits and stuff like that. I think those are that should be the real takeaway. I mean, like that is a, person, exactly right. a person's persistence yeah. and stuff like that, yeah. their attitude and the way they go around, like just like what you said about people earlier. You're, you're too. 100% right, mate, but most people just go and copy the actions. They, they don't. Very <clears> few <throat> people actually look at someone that's really successful and, and see what they do on a day-to-day basis. They try and copy what they do. So he goes and says this, so I'll go and copy that. But they don't copy the fact that the person takes the time to understand the person they're talking to or the personality traits nobody ever sees that nobody yeah. ever wants to see that part of it they want to copy the action which is what do you do every day but it's what's behind that person that makes them do it every day that makes it successful nobody ever sees that correct and that's the that's the challenge what you said is exactly right but nobody can see that a big part of what i do is teach people how to see that what actually makes you know what drives the engine what gets people to do what they do every day yeah, you know, getting out totally. there and doing something that works, but doing it with the right attitude is going to make all the difference. Exactly. So, mm-hmm. would you prefer to work with um, larger audiences, or you want to stay with like smaller audiences that was my in next terms question, of, of the dude. coaching, like more boutique style, or more like um, big public speaking? Tony Robbins, Tim Ferriss. Tim Ferry, um, Tom Ferry, I do a lot of public fuck. speaking and I enjoy that. Yeah, I mean, I, I love the public speaking because, and it's because you can really have a big impact on people. I love the one on one stuff as well, though, because there's nothing more powerful to me than sitting down with somebody and actually seeing their business grow. You know, I've been working with Jay um, for over a year now with, your, with the office and that, and actually seeing people succeed is the best motivation you'll ever get. And I know mean, Jay feels it every day when you there's nothing more powerful than an agent coming in and their life's changed because of the things that they've started to put in place. So I love the one on one stuff. I do a lot of speaking and I'll always do that you know I love the keynote speaking I love sharing the story um, mainly because my story is very real I tell you all the things I didn't do very well as well so I'm not one that sits up there and puts glitter on everything and makes it sound like it's an easy oh, road like just project, <laughs> yeah you know I, I just sharing the hardships I suppose sharing the you know the, the journey that you've actually got to go through to be successful it's not easy I mean I've had a lot of things in my life that haven't gone well I feel like the hardships is what makes you more relatable you mean like if you just stick uh, I went from zero to hundred with zero hiccups. And people are like, "Oh fuck this guy!" Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah they can't relate to that. Yeah, no, they, they can't. I mean, I think that's so true, though. I mean, <coughs> and, yeah, the learning from your mistakes is a, you know it's a it's a saying that a lot of people say. You know, you need to learn from your mistakes, and most people just try and forget them. For me, anything that goes wrong, that becomes the best education because I, all I do is I work out how the hell do I make damn sure that never happens again. Mm-hmm. You know, I've had a lot of you know I've had businesses that haven't worked. I've had. You know, things that haven't gone my way and you know they've been really really tough and we've all had dark days in our lives and but you know if you learn from them they make you smarter and you get up and you do something really cool about it and you change your business then you know, nothing else matters after that yeah mm. go ahead you Jamie. know I had something but I, but I just lost it I was just you know transfixed by the accent I think <laughs> <laughs> take your hand off my yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> well um if you don't have anything else, then yeah. let's let's give the uh, consulting company a little plug. Where can people find you, and how are you, are you taking people on right now? Yes, um, I'm booking and doing some really big bookings for uh, 2016, so people can find me. I've got a brand new website, uh, which will go live next week, uh, ready for 2016. That'll just be at aaronhodson.com. Um, and my email is just aaron at almhconsulting.com if anybody wanted to contact me that way. So... Uh, but some some big things, and uh, really looking forward to the book coming out too, because that'll that'll really show people the the real colors of what it takes to get to where it needs to be. But we have your cell phone number. That's yeah, what I was going to say. Is like, well, you, you can email me, and I'll give you a cell phone number. <laughs> yeah, that's it, yeah. I text them about uh, like four times a week. That's and it. and when is the book coming out? Uh, it should be due out in June, possibly a bit earlier. So it's it's progressed really really well. 
Um, and it's going to tie in with a, a speaking series that I'm doing, um, just you know, on, the, on the motivational side of things, on just how to really change your life. So that's cool, awesome. Mm-hmm. Thanks so much for coming in, Aaron. We really appreciate it as always. Okay, well, yeah, man. Good to be here. It's Aaron Hobson. Aaron the Hobson. Man, the myth, the legend. What does A L M H stand for? I'm guessing the A and the H are Aaron Hobson. It's my two daughters. Ah, uh, yeah, Madison and Lily are my two, uh, my two loved ones, my two baby girls, and that's that's where that came from. So got it. All right, well, cue the music, and this is where I edit out. If you would like to be on the Prestige Living Podcast or know someone that would be a great guest, go to www.prestigelivingpodcast.com. We'd love to hear your story.